visual problems where there's some sort of a picture on one side and then relating that to geometry on another side. My name is Jessica Purcell. I am a professor of mathematics at Monash University. Professor Purcell works in the field of topology, which can be described as the mathematics of shape and space. My research interests are three manifolds, hyperbolic geometry, and knot theory. Hyperbolic geometry is geometry of negative curvature. Curvature is something that you encounter daily in your clothing and in other objects that, that you may not be aware you are encountering it. It describes how things curve away from a flat plane. So shoulders are positively curved, but if you have flared clothing, like a flared skirt, then that would be negatively curved. But spaces that exhibit this are hyperbolic with negative curvature. This is a, an example of something that you may have seen in other mathematics courses called a hyperboloid. So if your neck is roughly the shape of a hyperboloid, but your head is, is more round, it's positively curved. The cell works on the interplay of hyperbolic geometry and three-dimensional spaces called manifolds. A three-manifold is a generalization of a surface. If you are standing on a surface, then you have two dimensions of directions in which to walk. So say the surface of the earth, you can go forward and backward, or you can go left and right. So that's two choices. If you are in three dimensions, you can add to that up and down. So in, when you're in a three-dimensional space, three-dimensional manifold, every point has three dimensions of direction in which you can go. So we know that the earth is a two-dimensional manifold. The surface of the earth actually folds up into a sphere. Uh, the universe is some sort of a three manifold, but we don't actually know which one it is at this point. So is it a sphere? Is it some sort of a strange donut shaped thing? There's evidence in various directions, but it's currently unknown what our universe is. Purcell is currently investigating triangulations of three manifolds. If you look at a surface, then a triangulation of a surface is you, you just take the surface and you cover it in triangles so that they match up vertex to vertex and edge to edge. If you look at computer representations of surfaces, they are almost always triangulated. So a lot of triangles, you, you will have seen sort of the teapot. These are triangulated surfaces. If you extend that into three dimensions, then you are looking at the triangulations become three dimensional, which is you add an extra vertex on top of your triangle and that gives you a tetrahedron. So a triangulation of a three manifold is filling in the space with tetrahedra. There are a lot of open questions about tetrahedra filling in three-dimensional manifolds. An important application is in computational topology. Many algorithms that are used to study surfaces expect a triangulation. So for example, if you want to save a three manifold in the computer, then you probably will be saving a big collection of tetrahedra. And if you want to run an algorithm on that and you want to determine something about your manifold, then you'll be able to run this a lot more efficiently if you have a minimal triangulation or a simple triangulation. And so our project is to try to identify minimal triangulations or to try to find nice properties of triangulation so that we can use these things to say more about the underlying three manifolds. During her SIMRI visit, Purcell will be collaborating with Professor Stefan Tillman I'm a professor of geometric topology here at the University of Sydney. I like to study manifolds ranging from surfaces to three and higher dimensional manifolds, geometric structures on these manifolds and spaces of geometric structures. Uh, Jessica and I, we've met at conferences over the years many, many times and we have many shared interests. And especially in the last few years, our interests have kind of converged more and more, thinking about triangulations of spaces. What is the smallest number of tetrahedra you need to triangulate a space? How can you use these tetrahedra to put a geometric structure on the space? Or what kind of obstructions are there? So these are some of the things we'd like to think about. Something else that the two mathematicians spend a lot of time thinking about is knots. A knot for a mathematician is really like this here. It's a rod or piece of string that's sort of in space and it closes up. So there's no beginning or end to it. Yeah, the knot can't really fall off this object here. And the way a mathematician sometimes thinks about this, this is this kind of a floppy object. We can sort of bend it and twist it. We're not allowed to cut it. 
And one way to study it is actually not to study the actual knot because that's a difficult thing to do, but it might seem a bit strange, but we actually like to think about the space around the knot. Knot theory is part of topology, so it's concerned with the properties of a geometric object that are preserved under continuous deformation. If you think about a one-dimensional space, I and mean, this knot is a one-dimensional space, but just around circle is also one-dimensional space. And there's no way I can now deform this knot. It, it truly is knotted. I cannot deform it in three-dimensional space into this round circle. So knot theory is really the theory of embeddings, yeah, embeddings of these one manifolds in three-dimensional space. But if I just think about one-dimensional spaces as by themselves as objects in their own right, then this one manifold is just the same one manifold as a round circle. Yeah, so it's always a question of with these kind of spaces, where do you study them and what properties do you study? Knots are just, they, they are very interesting examples of spaces to look at. So if you're trying to examine things in three dimensions, then it's useful to have examples of, of things to get your hands on and knots and the complements, the spaces around them, just give you a really wide variety of things that can happen. Purcell has been fascinated by knots for years, and she recently published a book on hyperbolic knot theory. I think that what attracted me to knot theory was just its variety and, and the hands-on nature of it and the visual nature of it. I believe that I first encountered knot theory in a popular mathematics book when I was an undergraduate. And I thought it was really cool, but I thought that there was no way that a serious mathematician could really play with knots all day. Uh, but then when I started working on my PhD and I was doing some very complicated geometry and deformations of spaces, it became clear that a natural application of this geometry was to knot theory. My favorite knot is probably the figure eight knot. This is the knot with only four crossings. It also happens to be the smallest knot that has a hyperbolic structure. Back in the late or in the 1970s, it was both Riley, I think originally, and then Bill Thurston were looking at the complement of this knot and they came up with a way of cutting it into exactly two tetrahedra. And if you make these tetrahedra completely regular and then glue them back together, you get the figure eight knot out of this. So it's a very, has this very beautiful, very simple hyperbolic structure, but it opens up a whole new world of applying geometry to knot theory, just in this simple example. Tetrahedral triangulations are frequently used in low dimensional topology which is the study of topological spaces of four or fewer dimensions. Say if I look at a rectangle and I want to make this rectangle into a standard cylinder, then of course it glues up like this here. Yeah. Now I can also choose to identify the edges the other way around with this twist here. And what I get then is the Möbius band like so. Yeah. But now what you can imagine is that actually, when I think about these two edges, one of the two edges has length zero. So if this edge has length zero, then I can really think of this strip as a triangle. Yeah. And then I can really think of one triangle where I take two edges of the triangle, I identify them with a twist and I get a Möbius band. And now what we do in three dimensions is we do the same thing, but with tetrahedra. And now we're allowed to sort of take the triangular faces of tetrahedra and glue them together with a twist. And so this makes our triangulations extremely efficient, but it also identifies a lot of edges and uh, vertices of these uh, tetrahedra with each other. A question that's fundamental to knot theory is how to tell knots apart. Broadly speaking, a knot invariant is a quantity defined for each knot that's the same for equivalent knots. When you have two different knots, it's, it's not always easy to tell whether you're looking at the same object or not. And so invariants help us to tell those things apart. Uh, some of the invariants that I look at in particular are related to geometry. So hyperbolic geometry in particular, and you can associate to the space around a knot, things like volume, cusp areas, shortest curves, things like this. And these all give you ways of telling two knots apart. So if two different knots have two different volumes, you know for sure that they're different spaces. This field of mathematics has led to predictions in quantum physics, like the existence of quasi-particles. 
In quantum topology, triangulations are used to define quantum invariants. Quantum invariants are invariants of the manifold that are influenced by uh, quantum physics, basically. When you distill these into uh, mathematical definitions and mathematical tools, then what you end up with are quite complicated invariants that are applied to these triangulations that are difficult to compute. And so again, this kind of goes back to the theme of we need simple triangulations because we have absolutely no hope of getting any information out of these quantum invariants if we have a complicated triangulation. We need to take the simplest possible thing in order to be able to convert these into formulas that we can work with. Purcell's research career began at an exciting time for hyperbolic geometry. Interestingly, around the time that I finished my PhD, there were several important conjectures that were resolved in three manifolds and in hyperbolic geometry. Questions about how infinite volume hyperbolic manifolds could be deformed. And these were also resolved and how they could be categorized and classified. One of her first research achievements was settling an old question about unknotting tunnels in a knot. So this would be an arc in a knot that if you were to drill that out, the whole knot would come apart and it would no longer be knotted. Using some of these new tools that had been developed from infinite volume hyperbolic manifolds, we were able to come up with examples of knots for which this tunnel was as long as we wanted it to be. This is one example of, of that where we created knots with crazy unexpected geometry. Purcell has since been investigating the hyperbolic properties of knots. I've looked at a lot of questions where we have combinatorial pictures of a knot. So this means a picture of a knot is usually a, a diagram on paper. You have some strands crossing over others and you want to be able to, just by looking at this particular picture on the paper, what can you say about its geometry? And that seems to be really hard. For particular classes of knots, for some families, it's easier to interpret the geometry. So alternating knots, for example, have the geometry seems to be pretty closely related to the, to the picture of the knot. So I've, I've done a few projects where I try and generalize this, try and kind of tease out what is it about these knots that makes them so special and so much easier to understand? How can we use that and see it in other examples of things? So questions like that. She's motivated by the opportunity to help the research community at large. So it's very satisfying to be able to solve a problem and to be able to understand a mathematical structure that hasn't that you haven't understood before. But it's important as a mathematician to be able to take that one step further and to be able to communicate that understanding. And I actually, that's something that I really like about mathematical research as well, is trying to describe the objects and the spaces that I understand in a way that other mathematicians can understand it as well, and a way that we can grow the community around that. So with this, mathematics becomes quite collaborative, really. Most mathematical research these days is done with other people. You're all discussing a problem that's interesting to all of you at the same time, and you're trying to look at it from different perspectives and come up with new ideas and describe what you understand in a way that your collaborators can understand. And it can really be a, a fun activity and a fun opportunity. Mathematics might even have the answer to the shape of the universe itself. This is something that three manifolds are involved in. I won't say that I study that question in particular, but it is a fascinating question. Perhaps it's a not compliment where it's sitting inside of a, a trefoil.